Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, we're going to go through some vertical projectile motion. So vertical projectile motion is exactly what it states. Basically, we're looking at motion where objects go up and down. So let's talk a little bit about some of the concepts. First of all, what makes an object fall? Well, Newton's law of universal gravitation states that every object in the universe exerts a force on every other object. So F is equal to G, M1, M2 of R squared, right? Where basically what we're saying is that every object in the entire universe attracts every other object. So when a ball is dropped, okay, so let's say here's the Earth, and let's say here's a really big drop ball, and it is dropped. It is attracted towards the center of the Earth, and that's supposed to be the center of the Earth, with the same force as the Earth is attracted to it. Okay, that's Newton's fifth, third law and Newton's law of universal gravitation. But only the ball moves. And why is that? Well, because the force that the Earth applies to the ball is called the weight of the ball. And the reason only the ball moves is because the Earth is so massive. Imagine this huge Earth, earth moving. What actually happens is, or oh, let's put it this way, the Earth does move, but it moves into such a, such a tiny amount that we cannot see it move and it doesn't actually move significantly, okay? So we can kind of ignore the movement. Whereas the ball, because it's with such a tiny mass, is obviously going to move towards the center of the Earth. Okay, so the object, when it is under the, only the force of gravity, is said to fall freely. And we say that it is under free fall if the only force at on it is the force of gravity and remember the force of gravity is called its weight okay so when we say weight watches that's wrong because actually it should be mass watches because weight is to do with the force of attraction by the earth or by the planet that we're on right so way less as well is also incorrect it should be massless so um obviously there is a problem with air resistance and we'll talk about air resistance a little bit later but when the air resistance is small enough okay to be considered zero then we know that the only force acting on it is the force of gravity okay and then we said that object is under free fall and any object that is under free fall is called a projectile so i know that these days people tend to think of projectiles as guns or well actually as bullets or drones or all sorts of interesting things and bombs but actually anything whether it be the eraser that you throw up into the air or the pencil or your book or whatever if the only thing acting on it is the force of gravity then we call it a projectile so what happens to an object in a free fall okay so what happens is it has been accelerated by the force of gravity okay and the force of gravity has an acceleration associated to it and on earth that acceleration is worked out to be approximately 9.8 meters per second squared so you can see that initially we have initial velocity here of zero and you can see that what is happening here is that the displacement per second is obviously increasing right and the reason the displacement is increasing per second is because the velocity is increasing as well. And you can actually see the difference in the velocity between each of these is always 9.8. So it's accelerating by 9.8 meters per second. To go from 9.8 to 19.6, what are we increasing by? 9.8. Okay, so every time from 19.6 to 29.4 is 9.8. So every time we are increasing our velocity by 9.8 meters per second for each second, so therefore the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. But in real life, there's air resistance, okay? And you get to a point with air resistance where the force upwards due to the air resistance is equal to the force downwards due to the force of gravity and at that point the resultant force is zero now a lot of people will say oh that means that the person has stopped falling 
No. Okay, no, they haven't stopped. If F res is zero, F res is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass hasn't disappeared. We haven't suddenly lobbed off his arm or his leg or whatever. What has happened though is that his acceleration has become zero. And if his acceleration has become zero, it means that we've got to a constant, we've got to a constant velocity. That's what's happened. And we call this constant velocity terminal velocity because it is the maximum velocity that will be established. Okay, that is the maximum velocity. So if you look over here, this is a typical thing of what might happen. So this guy jumps out of an airplane, okay, a helicopter, for some reason. And um, sorry, personally, I would not jump out of a <laughs> airplane. Um, a very good, I mean, if it's if it's airworthy, I don't understand it. Um, if it wasn't airworthy, then yes, we could discuss jumping out of the airplane with an with a with a parachute. But otherwise, no, thank you. So okay, so he jumps out of. He's a daredevil. He likes to live life on the edge, and he decides to jump out of this airplane with a parachute. So initially, the only force acting on him is the force of gravity. But the more he falls, the greater the faster he becomes, and the faster he becomes, the greater the force of air friction. So what happens is air friction starts increasing and eventually gets to the point where the force of the air friction, F of the air, is equal to the negative of the force of gravity. Okay, they cancel out. They're the same size but in opposite directions, which means that F res equals zero. If we had to write this as an equation, we would go F A plus minus the force of gravity, assuming which is F is positive, equals F res. And in this case, they would be the same. So therefore, F res would equal zero. Okay, so that's how we draw it. Okay, what's important about your um, force of air friction here, and that's very important for you to realize, and I'm sure you guys have seen it if you've seen videos, is that um, it's actually a cross-sectional area that makes a huge difference when it comes to your your air friction, okay, the force of air friction. If this person wasn't splaying out his arms and legs, he would have a much smaller air friction, force of friction, and he would therefore be able to accelerate faster. But because he's staying out his arms and legs, he's increasing his surface area, and the greater the surface area, the greater the air friction. Okay, so you need to be careful of that. Right. So we've said that a projectile is any object that is moving either upwards or downwards under the influence of gravity. In other words, it doesn't have a jet engine or anything that is helping it to fly. Okay, so for example, a golf ball, once it has left the golf club, the only force acting on it, if we're ignoring air friction, okay, the force acting on it while it's in the air is the force of gravity. A soccer ball, same thing. Once it's left that foot, the only force acting on it is the force of gravity. We've spoken about this. And this thing here, during this period, even though this has got an engine, I mean, this is a motorbike, and even though it's got an engine, this engine is not making this motorbike do anything, okay? It cannot propel it in any way. So during this jump, this motorbike and their rider are all under the force of gravity and therefore they are together a projectile, okay? So what happens during vertical projectile motion? So the object is going to start with This is wrong. Sorry. The object is going to start with a maximum velocity. Okay, the dude is holding his hand out and he's going to throw the ball up. Do 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 that. Okay, right. And they are going to throw the ball up. Right. It leaves the person's hand with a maximum velocity. And as it goes up, it slowly rises, but it also slows down as it rises. And the reason it slows down as it rises is because the only force acting on it, if we ignore air friction, 
is the force of gravity which is towards the ground, which means that it has a negative acceleration the whole time. It's got a negative acceleration. And what is negative acceleration means? It means that the acceleration is towards the ground while it is traveling up. At this point here, the velocity is instantaneously zero. There is a point at which the velocity is zero. After this point, it is going to start speeding up as it accelerates towards the ground. And please understand that at all times, the object accelerates downwards due to the force of gravity. So now what we're going to do is when you look at equations of motion, which you guys have come across, we've done equations of motion before, but we've done equations of motion with respect to uh, linear motion. In other words, cars traveling along straight level roads, etc., etc. Now we're going to look at equations of motion and use them to solve problems, which are vertical projectile motion problems. So first of all, what are your equations of motion? These are the ones that you have and you get given them. Okay, the most important thing about these equations of motion is identifying what each of these variables stand for. So Vf is obviously your final velocity. Okay, Vi is your initial velocity. A is your acceleration, and in this case, when we are talking about vertical projectile motion, it is acceleration due to gravity. And often, and often, instead of writing A, people will write G. So in other words, they would write this as Vf is equal to Vi plus G delta T. So instead of A, they're writing G, and that also gives you a hint that it's a vertical projectile motion question. And then delta x is the generic form for the change in displacement. And again, because this is a vertical motion section, a lot of people will change that to a delta y. So in other words, this equation will be written as vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2g delta why? It means exactly the same thing. It's final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration due to gravity times the displacement in the y direction. So it's exactly the same thing. It's just making one become aware of the fact that we are definitely using vertical projectile motion, that we've got the acceleration due to gravity and we're moving in the y-axis. And obviously change in time, delta t, I wonder why the words appeared, is equal to change in time. Okay, so now the best way to get to understand how to do these questions is actually to just try them. So let's go through it. It says a cricketer hits a cricket ball straight up into the air. So here is our little cricketer and his bat and he hits the ball straight up up into the air and eventually it's going to come down. Okay, the cricket ball has initial velocity here of 15 meters per second vertically upwards. Now the first thing it says what height does the ball reach before it stops to fall back down to the ground? Okay, so they want to know what is that height there? Question mark. Okay, so as with all equations of motion problems, I always suggest you write down all the variables that you have and the information you have, and then we can identify which equation we're going to use. So we've got the initial velocity. It is 15 meters per second. Okay. Final velocity in this case is what? Well, at this point here, where it stops, your final velocity is going to be zero. The acceleration is due to gravity, so it's 9,8 meters per second, negative 2. And we want delta, in this case, to make it easy for us and also just be used to it, we're going to write delta x. Okay, we want the displacement delta x. Okay, so first of all, we need to decide a direction as positive. And I'm going to randomly choose up as positive. Now, the rule is, guys, you can choose either up or down as positive, whichever direction. 
but you need to allocate it. You need to show the examiner what you've chosen. So we've chosen up as positive, which means the 15 is positive, but the 9.8 is negative because acceleration due to gravity is always towards the ground. And yeah, the ball is traveling upwards. So now my equations are VF is equal to VI plus A delta T. VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2A delta X. Before I go any further, do I have VF? Yes. Do I have VI? Yes. A, yes. Delta X, want. Yay, we're going to use this equation Yeah. Okay. So we write VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2A delta X. And remember, we're solving for delta X. Now, there are two ways to do these sums. We can either put the numbers in now and then solve for the delta x, or we can rearrange this equation in the form of so making delta x a subject of the formula, and then solve for it. So I'm actually going to do both ways so that you guys know how to do this. Okay, so first I'm going to substitute the numbers in, then solve for delta x, and the second one I'm going to solve for delta x and then substitute the numbers in, and then you guys must choose which one works for you, okay, because both those methods are correct. So let's go. Final velocity is zero squared is zero. This is 15 squared plus 2 times minus 9,8 delta x, right? So then that becomes naught is equal to 225 minus 19,6 delta x. So we've got minus 225 is equal to minus 19,6 delta x. So therefore, we've got minus 225 over minus 19,6 is delta x. And we're going to cancel both of those and find a calculator. So we go 225, oh, no, we don't. 5 divided by 19.6. And you end up with 11.48. So delta x is 11,48 meters. So that is the height, 11,48 meters. Okay, so that's how to do it the one way. Now I'm going to show you quickly the other way to do it, which is to make delta x a subject of the formula and then substitute in. I really don't mind which way you do it, and I don't think there's any teacher in the world that will mind which way you do it, as long as you're following the correct mathematical procedures. Okay, so we're solving for delta x. So we're going to go vf squared minus vi squared is equal to 2ax delta x because we want everything that's not a delta x onto that side. So we're going to move that to that side. Now we need to isolate the delta x. So we're going to divide both sides by 2a. So then this cancels with this. So therefore we've got vf squared minus vi squared all over 2a is equal to delta x. The final velocity is zero minus the initial velocity, which is 15 squared over 2 times 9.8, but that's a negative, which becomes minus 225 over minus 19 comma 6 which is going to give us 11.48 meters. So it really doesn't matter which way you guys do it, as long as you understand that whichever way you do it gets you the final answer and you follow the right mathematical steps. Now it says, how long was the ball, was the ball in the air? How long was the ball in the air? Okay, so do you agree that what goes up must come down? So if I work out the time it takes for me to get up, then I can double it and that'll be the total amount of time because the only force acting on this as far as we're concerned is the force of gravity, right? So it's got the same acceleration going up as coming down. So therefore the time it takes to go up has to equal the time it takes to come down. So then if we fill this in, we now have the delta x is 11 comma 4 8. We want delta t, but we obviously, as we know, want to try and not use the information we've just worked out in case we've messed up, in case we've messed up. Because ideally, we should try and use the information we were given in the first place 
to see to get the next bit of inf get the next answer because if we've messed up we end up with carryover errors okay so therefore let's look at our equations that we've got so far we've got vf is equal to vi plus a delta t we want delta t we've got the final velocity we've got the initial velocity we've got the acceleration yay we can do this so we've got vf is equal to vi plus a delta t now we're solving for delta t i'm going to substitute the numbers in okay so my initial velocity my final velocity is zero my initial velocity is 15 plus minus 9.8 delta t therefore we've got minus 15 is equal to minus 9.8 delta t therefore we've got minus 15 divided by minus 9.8 is equal to delta t and we can plop in our calculator and we can get 15 divided by 9.8 equals 1,53 so delta t is equal to 1,53 seconds but that's only up we need to double it to get the time down as well so that becomes a six that becomes a zero and that becomes a three. So that's three comma zero six seconds. Now there's another way to do this and I think I'm gonna show you that way. You, we've said that what goes up must come down. So if the initial velocity here is 15 meters per second, do you agree that the final velocity of a year, okay, has to be minus 15 meters per second because the only force acting on this as far as we're concerned is the force of gravity so it's traveling over the same distance it's traveling the same amount of time and therefore if it's got the same and so if you think about it this way okay let me draw it to you this way okay here we go okay yeah it starts off at 15 meters per second up right at this point here, the final velocity is zero. So this time is the same and this acceleration is the same. Over here, its initial velocity is zero. The time is the same, the acceleration is the same, the displacement is the same. So therefore, do you agree that this final velocity has to be negative 15? Because all the other factors are the same. So what I could do instead is I could find the time for the whole of this by using that the initial velocity is 15 and that the final velocity is minus 15. And then I would end up with this answer here, this 3.06. We could still use it in this 9.8, but then, okay, let me show you. So if I do this, okay, let's raise this bit here so you can see what I'm doing. So now I'm saying, okay, fine, for the whole flight, we know that it took off at 15 meters per second, but it's also going to land back at 15 meters per second for the simple reason that the only force acting on it is the force of gravity. So we've got VF minus VI over A equals delta T, right? The final velocity is minus 15, because I've chosen up as positive. Okay, minus, 15 because that's just initial velocity divided by the acceleration of minus 9 comma 8 equals delta t so you end up with minus 30 over minus 9 comma 8 is equal to delta t and obviously these cancel so if we do that we've got 30 divided by 9.8 and you end up with 3,06, which is exactly what we got last time, 3,06. Therefore, delta T is equal to 3,06 seconds. And grade 12s, just a heads up, if you get a negative time, okay, if your period is negative time, then, then you've done something wrong. Because as far as we're concerned, time does not go backwards. Okay, so your time always has to be positive. Right, let's try another question. It says, Peter throws a tennis ball straight up into the air. It reaches a height of 100 meters. Okay, so here is Peter, and he throws up his ball up into the air, and it comes back down. And this height here, that there, is 100 meters. And they want to know what is the initial velocity of the tennis ball. 
Now, it seems like they haven't given us enough information, but there's a lot of implied or implicit information in this. So what we need to do is write down the variables. We've got VI, VF, A, Delta X, and Delta T. And we need to choose something as positive. So I'm going to again choose up as positive. So the initial velocity, we don't know. But the final velocity, if we look at just this one part of the motion, is going to be, this final velocity is going to be zero because it has to be zero at the stop here before it starts coming down. Now, acceleration due to gravity is towards the Earth, is minus 9,8. And they tell us delta x is 100. And we want initial velocity. OK, so then let's think about this. We've got Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T. You've got delta X is equal to Vi delta T plus a half A delta T squared. We've got Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2A delta X. And you've got delta X is equal to Vf plus Vi over 2 delta T. OK. So what we want, we want something that does not have T in it. So this has got T in it, this has got T in it, this has got T in it. So the answer is this equation here again. So let's write it out. We've got V of squared is equal to V I squared plus 2A delta X. We've got the, we've got the final velocity. We want the initial velocity, we've got the acceleration, we've got the displacement. Yay, so we can solve for it. So the final velocity is zero, is equal to the initial velocity squared, plus two times minus nine comma eight, times by 100. All right, so do you agree therefore that VI squared is just going to be 19 comma six times by 100? So therefore, VI is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1960. So we're going to pop that into our calculators. So we go the square root of 1960 equals 44.27. So that is 44,27 meters per second. And do you remember I said plus or minus? Because it is a plus or minus because of the square root of a third, right? But which way is it going? Is it going up or down? Well, the initial velocity is going up. And we chose up as positive. So therefore, this is going to be a positive. And of course, you have to write up. Because they don't say what is the magnitude. They say determine the initial velocity. So you need to tell them the direction. OK, so that's 44.27. 44,27. Okay, now it says how long does the ball take to reach its maximum height? Okay, so now they want T. Now they want T. Okay, so if we look at this, we can say, okay, fine, we know that this is 44,27, but that's a rounded thing. So maybe if we could get away without using that and rather use the V of the A, the delta X, to get delta T, maybe we can find something. So is there anything here that uses V F A A and delta X, but not delta T? Yes, delta X, V I. That's VFVI, that's VFVI, and that's, oh dear, none of them. Okay, in which case, I would say, let's just go for the easiest one. Okay, so we've got VF is equal to VI plus A delta T. The final velocity is zero. The initial velocity is 44,27 plus minus 9,8 delta T. Therefore, minus 44,27 divided by minus 9,8 is equal to delta T. So we need to get out our calculators again. And we get 44.27. Oh, my hat. 4.27 divided by 9,8 equals 
and then we press it, it's 4.52. That is equal to 4,52 seconds. And that is the answer. We do not need to double it because it just says how long does a ball take to reach its maximum height. If it wanted to know how long would it take to get both up and down, then we would actually have to double that. Okay, right, let's look at another question. Okay, so Lestejo takes a trip in a hot air balloon. The hot air balloon is ascending at a velocity of 2.5 meters per second vertically. So it's going up at 2,5, right? She accidentally drops her phone over the side of the balloon's basket at a height of 45 meters. Yes, I know it's not to scale. Calculate the velocity with which the phone hits the ground. Okay. So this is kind of tricky because, and they love asking these questions, because what you need to realize is that the phone is going upwards at the time that it is dropped. Okay, think about it. This phone, if we are on a ledge, okay, on the top of a mountain, and we drop a phone down, do you agree our initial velocity is zero, okay? Because we are stationary with respect to the ground. But now we're in a hot air balloon. And with respect to the ground, we are moving upwards at 2.5 meters per second. So therefore, if we choose up as positive, the cell phone is actually starting with a very small initial velocity going up, okay, of 2.5 meters per second. So we can say the initial velocity of the cell phone is 2,5. Okay, they want the final velocity. The acceleration is towards the ground, and we've chosen up as positive. So acceleration is going to be minus 9,8. The displacement is going to be 100, and they want to know the final velocity. And we don't have, sorry, why did I say 100? Sorry, it is 45 meters, 45 meters. And they want the final velocity. Okay, so what's nice is we've got this equation, Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2A delta x. Let's check if it works. We want the final velocity. We've got the initial velocity. We've got the acceleration and we've got the displacement. But there's another thing here that you need to realize. We've chosen up as positive, but this cell phone is moving downwards. So this displacement is actually a negative displacement. It's minus 45. Why? Because it is traveling downwards and we've chosen up as positive. Okay, so let's fill in the numbers. We've got Vf squared is equal to Vi squared, which is going to be 2,5 squared plus 2 times minus 9,8 times by minus 45. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out the calculator and put this all in the calculator. Okay, so we've got 2.5 squared plus bracket 2 times now, a minus times minus is a plus, so I'm not going to worry about those minuses in the calculator, okay? So I'm going to go 9.8 times by 45, close bracket, equals. So therefore, Vf squared is 888,25. Vf squared equals 888,25, so we need to square root that. So we square root the answer, square root the answer, and we end up with 29,80. So the final velocity is 29,80 meters per second, and they said calculate the velocity, they didn't say the magnitude of the velocity, so therefore we need to say downwards. And that's pretty fast, guys. So that, let's think about that in kilometers. It's 29.8 times by 1,000 divided by 3,600. 
That is 8,3 kilometers per hour, which doesn't seem like a hell of a lot of time, space, but you've got to think about the fact that that is your cell phone that's falling at that rate, and that's quite fast. Okay. Right. Now let's try another example. We've got a ball that's dropped vertically from a cliff. Okay. So here's a cliff. We've got the ball and it's dropped vertically. Okay. It says if the vertical distance covered in the last second, in this last second, is equal to the distance covered in the first four seconds, find the height of the cliff. Hmm, okay. Right. So, first of all, we know that the initial velocity equals zero from here. Okay. So, let us let this bit here, it says if the vertical distance covered in the last second is equal to the distance covered in the first four seconds, okay. So we're going to say that this here is 4x. Okay, let me redraw this. Sorry, let's try again. So we've got a cliff, okay, and our seconds, we're just going to write out the six. So our time is going to be, okay, distance. Okay, so we're going to let this distance here be x, okay. And this distance here also be x, but this is the first four seconds. So this is t equals zero to t equals four, right? Then I just realized what's wrong with my drawing. No. Okay. So that there is x, right? And that's still t equals 4. Then we've got this final second, this last second, where this is also x, okay? But that is our last second, our final time, and this is t minus 1, okay? During that last second, we are covering exactly the same distance, okay? So now it says, find the height of the cliff. Hmm. It says, if the vertical distance covered in the last second is equal to the distance covered in the first four seconds, find the height of the cliff. Okay, so what we need is actually to think about this and decide if we can get some simultaneous equations going. So for the first four seconds, for the first four seconds, okay, what do we have? We have that our initial velocity is zero. We've got acceleration is 9,8, and I'm choosing everything downwards as positive to make it easier. Our displacement is going to be x, and our time equals 4 seconds. Agreed? Okay. During the last second, what do we have? We've got the initial velocity we don't know. The final velocity we don't know, it's not zero. Please grade 12, please. If you're falling, something falling from a cliff or you're dropping something and everything else, or you're jumping out of an airplane and your parachute fails to open, your final velocity is not zero. Your final, I know you hit the ground and you stop moving, but the reason you stop moving is because the ground has stopped you. It's not because your final velocity was zero. If your final velocity was zero, then what would happen is that you'd hover just above the ground and never touch it, okay? The reason that there is a dent in the ground when you fall out of an airplane without the parachute opening is because the ground has stopped you from falling. Your final velocity is not zero. I am ranting a little bit on that. But the most important thing is your final velocity is not zero, okay? Right, but what do we know? We know, we know that the acceleration is 9,8. We know that the change in time is one second, and we, which is basically going to be t minus t minus one, right? And we know that the, the change in x is going to be x as well. Delta x is x. Okay, so we know this bit here for this. Okay, and we have this. So do you agree we can get an equation? Yeah, so let's look at our equation of motion. We've got vf is equal to vi plus a delta t. We've got vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2a delta x. We have got delta x is equal to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared. And we've got delta x is equal to vf plus vi over 2 delta t. 
So do you agree that we could get a little equation going with this for this information? Okay, we've got free i, we've got delta t, we've got the acceleration, we've got delta t. So we could get what this x is, do you agree? So we could say, okay, fine, let's do that. So we could say, okay, fine, this is delta x is equal to vi, which is naught because the ball was dropped. That's how we know that the initial velocity is zero, times by the change in time, which is four seconds, plus a half times by the acceleration of 9,8 times by the time of four seconds squared. So that becomes four squared is 16 times by two is eight times by 9,8. So 8, 8 or 16, carry 1, 9, 8 or 72, so it's 73. So that's 73.6 meters. So this ball falls 73 comma 6 meters during the first four seconds, okay? We then know that means that this is 73,6 seconds. But that doesn't mean that the whole height is going to be equal to um, vertical distance covered the last second is equal to the distance covered in the first four seconds. Okay, we don't know if that last second is the next second or if it's 25 seconds later. All we know is that this displacement, which is during one second of the time, is 73.6 seconds. Okay, right. Everybody understand that. So do you agree that I could work out this final velocity here? Since I now know the displacement is 73.6 seconds, I know the change in time is one second and the acceleration is this. I can find this final velocity that it fell from. And then since I have its initial velocity and its final velocity, and the acceleration, I'll be able to find out the total displacement. So let's do that. So I'm going to work out VF. Okay, I've got delta X, I've got delta T, I've got acceleration. Can I get VF? Okay, I'm going to have to work out. Okay, I've got VF. Let's work it out. Delta X. I could work. Mm, do I really want to work out the initial velocity? Is there a way I could work out VF? Okay, we've got VF. Okay, I either have to work out the initial velocity. I have to work out the initial velocity first. It's very sad. Okay, so what we can do is we can use this equation to work out the initial velocity. Okay, and then what we can do is we can then use that equation to work out the final velocity and then we can work out the total displacement. Okay, so let's do that. So we've got this bit here. So delta x again is equal to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared. This delta x is 73 comma 6. We want the initial velocity this time, but the time is 1 plus a half times by a, which is 9 comma 8, because we chose down as positive, and the time is 1 squared. So therefore, we've got 73 comma 6 is equal to vi, and that becomes plus 4 comma 9. So the initial velocity, therefore, is 73 comma 6 minus 4 comma 9 meters per second equals vi. Therefore, vi is going to be, well, 6 minus 9 is 7, and then you've got 2 minus 4 is going to be 8, and you're left with a 6. So 68 comma 7 meters per second. And I've just run out of time, but we've just found out that the velocity at this point here is 68 comma 7 meters per second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this question in our lesson tomorrow. 
and I will carry on with that. Um, I would suggest that if you do watch this tonight, then try it before you watch my next lesson tomorrow and have a look, see if you can get it right. We're almost there. You can either, I have suggested that we work out the final verse here, but actually you can use this to find out what the total height of the cliff is as well. So think about that. Right. Have a good evening, grade 12s.